dreams before the king of my heart. I am not ashamed to say he was never ashamed of me when he came to give his life for me. Hello everyone, good evening and welcome to BMM Live. I can see my guest is online already. Hey Wesley, good evening. Um, just ask to be added to this video so that I can add you and we'll get in the groove. Alrighty, so um, this evening we're going to be talking altars. Altars, 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 altars. That's where we'll, where we'll be this evening. And um, Mr. Wesley is already on the line and um, I'm sure he's joined us in a bit. Um, if you've been on BMM Live before, you know we talk. It's light but it's deep at the same time. And this evening is not going to be any different. We're going to have some really valuable intense conversation where you find yourself in a place where you can get where you need to go i don't know why everyone is asking to be in my video the only person i want asking to be in my video right now is uh, my brother wesley so maybe i should invite him to come in let me look for him major reading man have added him so i'm waiting for him to come on once we come hey audrey good evening hi how on a day so i'm waiting i'm waiting i'm waiting please someone help me tell wesley i'm waiting i have waited i've um, invited him i'm waiting for him to join the video but yes we're going to be talking altars this evening what are altars what do they mean um what do they stand for are altars um relevant in the life of today's believer believer all of that and so much more is what we'll be talking about this evening i'm trying to wait for my um, my guests to come in so that i can do the introductions and then we will have a really good conversation but while i wait for him i've invited him while i wait for him to join us maybe i should begin to tell us about altars what is an altar you know now if you don't even know what an altar is you just need to be to watch Nollywood for a few days and um, you'll be able to tell what an altar is. Mr. Oh yes, he's asking me now, let me see. Let me see if he'll be able to join me now. Okay, so I was saying that if you really, if you are at a loss what an altar is, yes, my guest is coming on now, I'm excited. Um, he's trying to join me. I'm hoping, I've forgotten that Abuja and their internet is something else. Father, Lord, please give my brother access this evening. Good evening. We are waiting to see your face. I can hear you, but I, I can't can see hear your you. Face I've been hearing you, but. Yes, I the know. Net, the network here has been crazy. You know, Abuja, you people just don't want to come to the 21st century. I don't know what is with you people. When I come to Abuja, it's a song that is that. Jesus. Every ah, hindrance is lifted. Amen. <laughs> but uh, guys, can you hear his voice at least? I'm sure he will come on the picture at some point. If you can hear his voice, please just um, let us know you can hear him so that we can continue this conversation while waiting for the, the internet to let him in. Um, but what I was saying to you was that an altar, if you don't know what an altar is, I'm sure if you watch Nollywood, you know what an altar is. They're always in front of one stone thing, breaking something. Or if you can hear something. my voice, just indicate. Yes, they, I'm struggling yes, to come um, to, yes. to show my face. but um, Yes, I think they can hear you. People say they can hear you, so we'll keep... Um, okay, they can hear your voice so well, so... We will continue as long as we can have this conversation, and then I hope that um, oh my Father Lord, you give us clearance and have your son come in in full. Okay, so um, an altar is a place where sacrifices are made. But beyond the an altar being a place where sacrifices are made, an altar is a place of an encounter. If you bring it to the Word of God, an altar is a place of an encounter. I don't want to preach this evening. But I'll just quickly show you two things in the Bible. 
and then we will go. I will invite um, Wesley to come, and then I'll just let him talk to me about all, talk to us about altars. So in Genesis mm. 26, um, um, Jacob was left his father's house. He was running away from Esau. His parents had sent him to go to Laban, his uncle, and stay there in Padan Aram. And so when he left for Haran, on the way, he chanced upon a place called Lord. And the Bible said it was dark when he got there. So, um, um, so he was, it was dark and he decided to spend the night there. But during the night, he had an encounter. He saw a ladder, you know, or, you know, reaching up to heaven. He saw angels ascending and descending from that ladder. And the Lord, he had an encounter that was peculiar to him in that place. When Jacob woke up, he said something. He said, this is the house of God. And I, they said, yes, this is the house of God or the place of God. And I knew it, and I knew it not. Mm-hmm. Long and short of the matter, when he came to himself, the first thing that, um, what he did, was his name? The first thing that uh, Jacob said he would do was that he made a commitment to give a tithe of all that he had so that uh, all that he, that if the Lord preserves his life he will give a tithe of everything that he owns so that was his first commitment the second thing that he did was that he built an altar and he named that place Bethel and that place is called Bethel today now the reason why I'm pointing you to that place is if I don't give you that example you may not understand what an altar is in Genesis 35, um, yes, in Genesis 35, Jacob was on his way back home. Now he was running again from Laban, that he was going back home. He was running from Laban, running towards Esau, and he did not know what it was that he was going to meet on when he got back home. At some point, he divided his family into two. He told one to go this way. He told one to go the other way. And he stayed back somewhere. Here's where he went back to. He went back to Bethel. And while he was at Bethel, that was where he wrestled with the angel. And his um, his hip was full out of joint. And ultimately, his name was changed. The point I'm trying to make to, with, uh, uh, with this illustration is that an altar is a place where a Christian has an encounter. Why an altar is always a, also a place of sacrifice is no man has a defining encounter with God and God gets up and leaves. Every time you find yourself in a place where you have a defining encounter, or true believers or Christians who know what they are doing, let me say it that way. When you find yourself in a place of an encounter, encounter, what we usually would do is build a, build an altar. The reason we build an altar is one so that we will always remember that place. And two, so that we can follow through on the protocol of accessing God in that place. So an altar is that place where you have had a meeting with God. And no matter what is happening, if you go back to that place, you will meet with God again. Now that I have laid the background, Wesley, talk to me. What do you think about altars? Are they relevant in these days? Do they even exist? Do you agree with what I have said? Is that biblical or do you think it's wishy-washy what do you think definitely, about definitely not wishy-washy i am i am on the same lane uh, uh, i'm so sad that uh, they can't see my face but i hope they can hear me. Hmm. and hmm. Uh, altars are altars voice than they have ever been and um, so i uh, uh, so we, uh, if uh-huh. today, if there's no altar, then we have no faith, we have no salvation, we have nothing at all. Uh, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to flow. Okay. An altar mm-hmm. is a place of presence. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. We need to get that before we get anything. Mm-hmm. Even before the sacrifice, even before mm-hmm. the exchange, it is a place of presence. And altars are associated with dates. Mm-hmm. Power and about mm. the that high power that date. So the and the expression of fellowship by that deity so the presence. And also is a place mm. and a place of communion. Mm. It is a place of fellowship. If I had to mm. Mm.
อืมอืมเรื่องสังเกตบาดเย่ we can now barely hear you the 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 sound is cutten so I can't even um No, we can't hear you. The sign, the sound is breaking. Um, so there's no one sentence that. No, no, the sound is dragging badly. The sound is dragging badly. So I can hear you. Can other people hear him, please? Okay. So. Um, Let's hope. But let me do a recap of some of the things that I think you have said that I heard. You said that before anything else, that an altar is a place of presence, and an altar is always affiliated to a deity. Um, I would like to use the word divinity. I know why you use deity because deity is the general thing that makes people build altars. But since we're talking biblically, I would want to use the word divinity. So it is the presence of the divine in a place that makes the place an altar. That's what I'm under. I understood from the uh, few things that I could pick from what you have said. You said that the altar is a place of communion. The altar is a place of koinonia, and the altar is a place of fellowship. So it is the presence of God that makes somewhere an altar. And you did say, I think I heard that as well, that.、Um, If there is no altar today, that an altar is even more relevant today than it had ever been any time in history. That if there was no altar, then we would have no fellowship, we would have no salvation, we would have no relationship with God. Those are the things I heard so far. So I'm going to pause and have you talk again. Let's see whether the sound is better. Yes, yes, I can hear now. I can hear this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Covenant and promises. Mm-hmm. Mhm. Yes. Mhm. 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 Yes. Yes. Uh huh. Hmm. 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 Mm. 
Wow. We can't hear you at all now. We cannot hear you at all. We cannot hear you at all. How about we try this? How about we try this? Because the sound is really bad. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. 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 So I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking we should try something. I'm thinking you should drop off the video and then I don't know how fast you type, type your conversation because it's actually better that you make three points and the people get to grab hold than, you know, this is scrolling and it's dragging and people can't hear. So the experience won't be as seamless. So if you type something and you send to me, for instance, I can actually now, um, the only problem is you can't send me a WhatsApp. I can begin to echo it. Um, Liz, if you can hear me, if you can just quickly send Wesley my MTN number. He could actually send me text messages. But you can just type in the comments what you're saying, and then I'll echo it. And then if it's something that you agree with or something, I, I know we have to come back and do this. But just so that the people who have logged on will have an experience that is relatively good. So uh, I would suggest that you drop off the video and then use um, use test why I stay on the video. I think that will be our best plan for today. Abuja, you guys have to wake up. They have to do something about that. <laughs> Jesus, go to Abuja now. <laughs> well, okay, so I think that's what we should do. It's amazing. Mm. Okay, so what I'm going to ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to do, why Wesley is um, putting his thoughts together. So far, if you heard anything at all, would you like to ask questions? Just type something so that we'll go from there. Wesley, I'm going to bump you off the video now. So I'm just going to take you off the video, okay? Okay. I can't even take you off the video. That's amazing. Um, okay, so I'm just going to go on because to even get you off the video is now. Okay, so I've removed you from the video. All right, great. So um, part of what... Um, Wesley had talked about is that the altar is a place of presence. The presence of God dwells in a place. And he said that when in the second time, the few things I heard, he talked about a place. That when we say to some ourselves or to someone, this was the place that I met with God. That it had to be a place where of deliverance. It had to be a place where an exchange was made. It had to be a place of maybe you are in a hard place of a sickness, a disease, a a lack, a fear, a fight, and God showed up for you, that every time God shows up for a man in a place, that place automatically becomes an altar to that person. Now, one of the great things I know, or one of the things I know that should always happen for those who are careful to put together an altar or remember, it's, it's remembrance. You cannot have had an encounter and forget it. As far as I'm concerned, there are defining moments in my life. This evening before I came on, I was scrolling through Instagram and I saw someone had posted something. And she was saying, if you are called of God, do you remember? And she did ask, I think, three questions. You know, three questions that you ought to answer to be able to write down how you were called and what you were called about. Uh, what you were called for and how you were called by God. And as I read through her questions, I just remembered I went right place to the place and the point where God first commissioned me. I will never forget. I remember it to the tiniest details. The point is when you hit a place of an encounter, you never forget. You never forget. The problem we have found is that a lot of us now live in an age where we take nothing serious. We just leave. There are no boundaries. There are no parameters. There are no... Um, sacred things, there are no, we just, we just flow. We wake up and we just flow. And that is the reason why a lot of us don't remember our altars. 
But something as I would say about altars, you know, I'm waiting for Wesley to type something. I have to keep doing this. An altar is a good place of the presence, yes. Uh huh. And, um, one thing that I know about altars that I'd like to share with you is the fact that altars come with protocol. Altars come with protocol. Altars come with protocol. Anyone who has had an encounter and has built an altar before will tell you that altars come with protocol. Altars come with protocol. And in the last couple of days, yes, um, God has been teaching me about the protocols of the altars. So Wesley is saying altars were built by laymen and also by priests. Now even more so, because in the New Test, in the New Covenant, we are all priests and we are all kings together. So what that means is that an altar definitely, an altar definitely, anyone can actually get in a place of an encounter and build an encounter. But so that we don't make a mistake and we don't begin to look for stones to build anything. These days the altars are not built by hand. There is no, it's not, there is no shigidi somewhere. That's why they call an effigy. You don't have to put together an effigy. You don't have to collect stones and pour oil on them, on them. No, all of those things no longer exist. The altars that we build in these days are built in our hearts, okay? You build an altar in your heart. You hold an experience and encounter there to you. And every time you find yourself in a bind, you remember that place. And every time you go back to that place, that what is bound to happen is you are bound to meet God there. And in meeting God there, things begin to change or things begin to um, happen with you or for you. So I'm going to go on and see. He says, altars are by laymen are, were lifted from memorial and remembrance. Altars were for thanksgiving. Altars were for witness. Altars are for promise and for covenant. Altars were for sacrifice. You can see the many things that um, God, you know, that come into building an altar. The question I'd like uh, Wesley to answer for me is why do we not talk about altars any longer? Today, altars are no longer on the outside, yes. So you don't, if you come into my premises, you can come every nook and cranny in my house. You will not see one stone anywhere. That's not the way altars are built these days. So altars are not built on the outside. They are built on the inside. The Bible actually says that the entire person is the temple of the Holy Ghost. So if you are the temple of the Holy Ghost and you go into the Old Testament to see what the temple looks like, you will know that there was a part of the temple that housed the altar. Just the same way the man today houses an altar in his heart. So the altar is no longer on the outside. Jesus became the ultimate and once and for all sacrifice, yes. But after you've received him into your life, then you must never forget that encounter. Every one of us came to Jesus by an encounter. And when I say encounter, I'm not talking of thunderings. I'm not talking of moonlight. I'm not talking of scary things. But I know that there was a day when something shifted in your life because you came in contact with Jesus. And the reason why you continue to follow him today is because you remember that experience vividly. So Jesus here became the ultimate once and for us sacrifice. But in that place, we have the ultimate altar, the cross. The ultimate altar is the cross. So every time you understand what an altar is, every time you remember your encounters, you would definitely begin to see the things that come with having an altar. Someone is asking me to explain the um, the protocol of altars. Now, um, yes, the altar is our mind. Yes, I just said so. Your mind or your heart, that's where you build an altar. Yes, everyone wants me to talk about the protocol of the altar. I will come to the protocol of the altar. Just slow down for me. I want to make sure I catch everything that Wesley is typing. He says, no more stones. We are the living stones. So yes, there are no more stones. Everybody wants, Nigerians are be my people. Not too like, we're not too like the cocoa, the one way hide. When they talk the whole way down outside, and I want to die the entire inside. Slow down. And cool temper, they come. Okay, so the altar was in the midst of the temple. So now if the body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, then automatically you know that the altar is within you. The altar is a place of your remembrance. So what part of you makes remem remember stuff? 
what part of you um, makes decisions? Because the altar is a place of sacrifices and decisions. What part of you does that? I say the heart. He says the mind. They are one are the same thing, okay? So when you know that you're, you have the capacity inside of you to reproduce, this is one of the things. Let me quickly say it so I don't forget. One big thing about altars is altars enable you to reproduce miracles. If you have enjoyed a miracle in God before and you remember that encounter and you build an altar around it in your heart, I promise you, you will always be able to recreate that miracle, either for yourself or for another person. A lot of us go through one-off miracles because we were not paying attention to everything that happened around that altar. So we leave and another day you find yourself in that same situation. You do not even remember what it is that God did or how he did it. You know, and that can bring us into a place of a frustration because something says to you, I've been here before. I should be able to process this. But you are struggling because you did not build enough memoria around your encounter. And Wesley says an altar is our mind, cognitive and non-cognitive. I wish I went to school and I could explain that. I know Congo school, so I'm not sure I can even explain cognitive and non-cognitive. But you know that's conscious and unconsciously. Part, that's part of it. Whether you recognize it or you don't recognize it. There is something about altars. There is something about altars. Our intellect, yes. So altars is, are, the place, are the place that enable you to recreate miracles. And so when believers have, if you have been healed before, for instance, and you were paying attention to your healing, the tendency is you can take another person through the process to get healing. If you were deep in a transaction with God to arrive at your healing, you will never forget. You will never forget. So automatically, you can reproduce the miracle of healing in your life and in other people's lives. But if you went through and you just went through and you did not, you just went by the mercy of God, you did not receive grace to understand the process of what it is that you go through, then the tendency is you won't be able to reproduce that miracle. And from where I see it, an altar is that place for me, for me to go back and reproduce miracles. So there are things that my children, even this afternoon, my son has called me to say, Mommy, I have a bit of a problem. And the first thing I thought about was, okay, what do we do? Of course, I know to pray. Then I remembered his sister has been here before, and he ended in praying. So I just said to him, okay, I'm just going to pray for favor for you. Because that's the way it works. And all, the reason why altars were built in the Old Testament um, is because they wanted to remember. And they could always come back. Aside from the sacrifice, it was a place you could run to. When you run and you get there, then things begin to change and begin to enhance for you. Because by just coming to the altar, again, what you do is you make a declaration and say, Lord, I know you met me here before. And I'm confident you will meet me here again. Are altars related to patterns? Um, more like processes for me, not patterns. Processes and then protocol is more like that for me. But yes, is there anything else I have missed that Wesley said? Our judgment, our thought patterns, all of that determine what our altar is. I'm loving this. Unfortunately, I would have loved for you to say this and that your voice by yourself. But like we said, we will come back and we do altars part two. But that day we will be very sure that Abuja network or that we will just fly my brother somewhere else where network works. Jesus will give us that grace in Jesus' name. But my point is that Altars are very important to children of God. And why a lot of people will be like, who talks about altars in this modern day? Let me use my adult plan. And that makes you day where you day. There's how many years you see they the same place. People who understand altars are battlefields. We have, you know, my husband, we were talking yesterday, and he said, oh, that's true. I need to go to the court of heaven for that. It was very simple. It wasn't something that he was stressing over. The reason why he could just quickly arrive at the decision that I'm going to go to the court of heaven over the matter is because he's had other things before and he went to the court of heaven over them and the things gave way. Jesus said to the seven sons of Sceva, 
um, not Jesus. He said the seven sons of Sceva came and said, and he said to his disciples, he said, this type does not go except by prayer and fasting. There was an altar built around that deliverance that his disciples did not know about, that Jesus called their attention to. Fasting and prayer, he said to them. But if you want to know about the protocols of the altar, let me just um, quickly go there. The love of your mind is an altar. Let me quickly go to um, the seven sons of Sceva that we find that story in the book of the Acts of Apostles. You know the story. We've all joked about it. The seven sons of Sceva were trying to carry out deliverances for money. So they came and they met someone who was demonized and they said to him, in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches, come out. And the, de the demon said to him, Paul, Jesus we know, Paul we know, you, who you be. And the Bible said the demon tormented, the demons tormented them, beat them and tore their clothes. What was wrong with them? Did the Bible not say that in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord? Why did the seven sons of Sceva deploy the name of Jesus? Even if they said it's in the name of Jesus that my bishop preaches. Why did, did how come did, um, the demons were not bowing? Why would the, Jesus, uh, the demons ask them that question? Because like Wesley said, there is a presence at the altar. And if you do not know the divinity that, that carries, that is embodied in that presence, you cannot, whatever you put on top of that altar will not work. There, you know, have you ever been traveling? Well, I hope you never get in a vehicle and it's about to be involved in an accident. But I've heard <coughs> this story, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, and we joke about it a lot, where people are in the mall where travel, traveling, and all of a sudden, it looks like there's going to be an accident. And the guy that was screaming shop for not five minutes ago is now screaming in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. And you are wondering, how did he move from Shopano now to name of Jesus? And so there are people in the body of Christ, in church, let me use it that way. There are people in church who have deployed the name of Jesus that if the name of Jesus still finished, he would have finished by now. But they've never moved ahead. What was the problem? The problem was in one thing and one thing alone. An altar is only as effective as the relationship you have with it. So unless you have a relationship with the divinity that manages or that covers that altar, there's absolutely nothing you can do. Let me see whether Wesley can come in now. Yes, go live with Wesley. Let me see what will happen. Maybe he'll be able to come in now. So my point is, that because of that, in the case of the seven sons of Kiva, for instance, they did not have a relationship with the Jesus. Yet they wanted to cast out demons in the name of that Jesus. And obviously, it did not work. So when I begin to talk to you about the protocol of the altar, if I'm talking to you that every altar has a protocol. For instance, what did Jacob say about Bethel? He said to the Lord, he said to the Lord at Bethel, he said, if I go and come back in peace, and if you'd increase me, I will give a tithe. Jacob by himself set up a protocol for the altar. And so what that would, what that would mean was that one of the pillars of Jacob's relationship with God to continue to enjoy God and receive from God was that commitment he made by himself, which had now become a protocol for that altar. They are one-off altars and they are recurrent altars. For instance, when you go to, um, in the book of Exodus chapter 3 or 4, where Moses went, you know, saw the, had the encounter of the burning bush, what did God say to him? He said, take off your shoes. The ground on which you are standing is holy ground. That is a protocol of that altar or that encounter. In the book of Joshua, I believe it's Joshua chapter 5 uh, or 5 or 6, we also see that Joshua had an encounter where the, yes, it was chapter 5, where this, um, the, the, what's that guy called? Um, how did the Bible talk to him? The one that introduced himself as the Lord, as the, the, the commander of the, uh, uh, of the, of the Lord, the Lord of hosts or something, the commander of the armies of God, something like that yeah. in Joshua chapter 5 towards the end. 
Yes. What did what did he say to Joshua after that conversation? He said to Joshua, "Take up your stand. Take off your sandals. The ground on which you stand is holy ground. Those are protocols of the altar." When it comes to my children, there is an altar around my relationship with God concerning my children. And every single time I think about my children, I remember that there is always something on the altar concerning them. Every altar has a protocol. The protocol would refer to maybe the sacrifice on that altar or the commitment that you have, the things you said you would do. Before God, it doesn't have to be slaughtering something. It doesn't even have to be giving up something. It's just that you remember that in this place, this is what I said to God that my life will be about. And so every time you come upon that altar, you remember the protocol. And as long as you keep your part of that bargain, then the altar continues to speak for you. But we have believers who have nothing. Everything, their, their altar is not in, your, in their minds. Their altar is in their belly. Everything, they eat it warm. They remember nothing. They sleep through their lives. They don't pray. They don't fast. Spiritual discipline is zilch. And they are wondering why some people are going and they are getting things done and they are achieving things in Christ and they are standing still. Because at some point, someone, or they got the wrong memo, or they read the memo wrong, that because they are born again, they don't need to do anything else. You don't need to do anything else by working. But there is a maintaining of your relationship. I call it a pursuit of fellowship that you must do so that your altar consistently has fire. Because in the Old Testament, they don't do cold altars. The altar has to have something on it and it is burning. The question is, like the church of Laodicea, are you hot or are you cold? Let me see whether we can hear Benjamin. Benjamin, try. Or Wesley, I don't know. You know me and you now. I've not called you Malachi. That's a good thing. So but at least you can. Let me see if I can hear. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, I can hear you. <laughs> nah, no worries, there's no fire. Yes, the commander of the Lord's army, yes, yes. Okay, so speak to us, please. Yes. Yes. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Mm. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
ओके Mm. Yes, I can hear you, but it looks like nobody else can. But I can hear you all right. Yes, I could hear you. So um, Wesley has said a lot of things. If I can parrot them, let me try. But he's focused on the mind, on the mind being the seat of your emotions. The mind being the the mind being the place where you carry out your struggles and your battles. The mind being the place where you hear the voices or you don't hear the voices. And that if you don't make the decisions in your mind, if you don't win the battles in your mind, if you don't renew your mind and allow the Spirit of God, the presence of God to dwell in your mind, then obviously that's going to um, begin to cause a lot of friction for you in the protocols of being able to sit at the altar and get the things that the altar has to offer. Because while the altar is while the altar is, I'm going to take you off um, because I'm hearing an echo. So, um, Wesley, I'm going to take you off the video as well again. Hmm. That is even a journey. No, it's fine. Uh I'm not even able to do that right now. So see whether you can drop off the video on your in your end, please. At your end, please. Okay, yes, I'm able to. Okay. Okay, so guys, I'm so sorry this is happening, but we I really thought we were going to have a great conversation today. There was just the network. You can see that Wesley is raring to go, but IG is not complete. Yeah, so we can't do a Facebook session and bring him in. So that's why we didn't do Facebook. So, but we will see what will happen. Um, I may need to get into another app to be able to do this, but that's not going to happen today. But like I have promised you, I'm going to have to bring him back and we'll have this conversation all over. But suffice to say, um, if I'll continue from where I have stopped, if I can remember that an altar, altars are very vital for your relationship and for your growth in God. Altars are very vital. He talked about holiness being the protocol. I think holiness is the foundation of the protocol of the altar. But there are so many other things that vary from one individual to another individual. Inside of the protocol of the altar, you find, um, you find vows that people make. And when people hear vows, they usually think, okay, we will consider uh, Zoom. When people hear, but that's not going to be this evening, okay? It will be another day. Um, when people hear vows, they go to money and they go to pledges. But no, I have a 22-year-old in my house who part of the protocol of his personal altar with God is that strong drink will not pass through his lips. We were not the ones that entered that vow with him. We had absolutely nothing to do with it. This was a decision he made by himself in the place, like Wesley said, of a struggle that was going to take him out. And he ran to God by himself and he said to the Lord, if you would deliver me from this and get me where I'm going, I am making a commitment to you today for the rest of my life. I shall not taste strong drink. Now, what holiness is at the foundation he has now expressed his desire to continue to do the will of God and to work with God in tangible terms, considering that he was in the UK and he was in a group of, uh, was in a place where young people drank beer like water. And so he looked at it and he said, what's the most costly thing I can give up lifestyle-wise? And that was something that he could give up. 
So when you talk about the protocols of the altar, these are some of the things. Somebody asks, can the patterns be the protocol? If God is the one that is giving you a pattern and a, or a template, yes, then you build your relationship around that. So that whatever it is, you push it. For me, I think one of the greatest things that from the protocol of the altar of my, of the altar for me is obedience. So hear and do as I hear. Obedience that is not subject to conversations. I don't take my instructions and go and discuss them with 15 people. I am very clear. Once I'm convicted by God and convinced by God that this is the way to go, then those particular instances I am close to conversation. I do not have conversations about them. The reason is because obedience runs really high in my interactions with God and in the places he's asked me to go and the things he's asked me to do. If you just, I think that what I'm, what today will probably end up doing for you is help you to begin to think. You need to continue to think about it and say, okay, now that they are talking altars, let me even begin to think about it. Where in my life can I say that these are the things that God has done? These are the things that God has done. These are the things that God has done for me over time. And these are the patterns. These are the protocols. And these are the decisions that I reached in my mind for the execution of ongoing miracles. Because God called us to reprocess miracles and reproduce them. The decision to be healed, like Wesley is saying, he's emphasizing our minds, our minds, our minds. The decision to be able to receive healing is from your mind. The decision to think that the ailment will heal you is from your mind. Whatever you are not able to conceive and receive in, on that altar, you are not able to walk out. But I'm saying that beyond receiving it, that there, there, there are peculiar ways that God helps us to work out our salvation. Wesley, if I remember, I'm not going to go into the story. I don't think this is a place for it. But when we, uh, when, um, we had this, um, the, the broadcast around the bank table, you know, um, in Abuja the last time I was there, which, you know, after that we were talking and we're sharing testimonies. You told me, you gave me a testimony. And that testimony, as the more I thought about it after you left, all I could say to myself was, this had to be someone who, um, what's the word, who transacted with God based on covenant. And covenants are only made at altars. Covenants are only made at altars. And so when I think about it, I said to myself, only God, only a man who truly understands his God or knows his God would Follow the kind of instructions, Wesley, that you followed in that season of your life, as you shared with us. So when I begin to talk about the protocols of the altar, there are things. Honor is a protocol of the altar. Honor is a protocol of the altar. I don't really care who it is that you are. I don't care who called you and how anointed as you are. If you begin to dishonor people, you have just messed up your own, the altar that God has set up for you. Honor. Obedience, holiness, these are protocols of the altar. In those days, they would say if you've touched a dead body, you can't come through close. That was what? If a woman was in her period, she couldn't come close. What was all that talking about? It was talking about whatever they termed as uncleanliness cannot come close to where God was. But today, we just mess it up. We go, we come back. The worship leader wakes up in his girlfriend's house and comes straight to church and picks up the microphone. A desecration of the altar. A desecration of his altar. But he doesn't see it as anything anymore. And the reason why we don't esteem these altars anymore is because people are no longer dropping and dying from them. So it's okay for us to just do it whichever way we want to do it. I mean, who's looking, who is asking, who is counting? But no, the God of heaven is watching. In, in the book of Jeremiah, he said, the Lord searches the heart. In Genesis, he said, the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Yet I, the Lord, I search the heart. The heart. In Jeremiah 33, he comes and he says, I will show you the things, the deep things. So you can't be the believer 
who has no boundaries. The point I'm making, if I will make it now, is that every altar has boundaries. A lot of us come and we are touting or pushing the freedom and the liberty we have with God. And we have taken that liberty as license to be stupid. But that's not the way altars work. That's not the way going, walking with God works. If you want to be truly free in Christ, then there are things that parameters that your mind cannot exceed. There are places your mind cannot go. And that is why this, yes, that's why the scripture says that, um, how does it say? That we should cast down every imagination that wants to exalt itself above the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Cast down imagination. Where does that happen? In your mind. That's why Wesley keeps saying that the altar is in your mind. Because until you are able to cast down the imagination, you will do what his, I can see his chat saying now. You will offer strange fire at the altar. Sinful lifestyle. Just going like people who have no boundary. And do you know what without? Without grace. We say, oh, I'm a son, child of grace. Therefore. But that's not the way grace was meant to work. Grace was meant to make you responsible. Grace was not meant to make you without boundaries. Oh no. That wasn't what grace was meant for. Grace was not supposed to be the reason why you have no boundaries, you don't do obedience, you don't do holiness, and, and such like. Grace was really why you should be able to do all of these things. And so we have a lot of us desecrating altars a, on a daily basis. Sometimes from even the words that we are speaking, you can tell that our altars are filthy, never been cleaned, never been cleaned out. No fire has been put on it for months and years sometimes. And so you can't be free and truly exercise your liberty in Christ if you allow your mind to be broken down. Anything goes. There are no filters. You have no gates. Anything that comes, one. As my Edo people would say, you just swallow it. You get in trouble ultimately. And so if I would begin to round off quietly and begin to talk to God about Abuja Network now, because it has now made it on my prayer, on my prayer list, because of what it did to me today. My brothers and my sisters, there are too many things in Christ that we have not been paying attention to. And what I'm trying to, we are trying to get you to see today is that if you do not pay attention to the things you let into your altar, ultimately, the mind is one of the most brilliant parts of you. Ultimately, that mind would destroy you. <laughs> Grace demands more than laws. Yes, it demands your entire life. But we don't know that. Or most people don't understand that. So they think that grace means just mess up and God, and God covers you. That's not what it means. He's a forgiving father. He's a father who would never, never, never forsake us. But our God has standards. He has standards. If the Old Testament or the Old Covenant is a foreshadowing of the new, then what you ought to see is that when you were bringing an animal, when they were bringing an animal in the old, old covenant to sacrifice before God, the Bible said without blemish, without wrinkle, they would check it out. I mean, they would scrutinize the lamb to make sure that it didn't have any comma before they would put it on the altar and slaughter it. When Jesus came, he says he's preparing him for himself a bride without a body, without blemish and wrinkle. Now, if we sit down and we are truthful to ourselves, when was the last time you sat down and you thought to yourself, do I have wrinkles as part of the body of Christ? We don't think about it. When was the last time you thought about, am I a spot in the body of Christ? We don't think about it. We come and our song is, my name is Jimmy, give me all you got. Forgetting that there are protocols, there are processes, there are procedures, for us to be able to get to the place that we need to get to in God. What I'm hoping that this evening will do for you is open your eyes to the capacity that you can live powerful and give you the permission to begin to do the 
research, do the praying, do the fasting, do the listening, do the learning that will bring you to the place where you can truly get into God and be victorious every single day. The, the, the conversation is not that you will not be tested. The conversation is no matter where it swings, you have victory. That's the conversation. The conversation is not that you will not struggle. The conversation is when you hold on to God the way you ought to hold on to Him. 247, you have victory. You have victory and the victory will look exactly like God wants your victory to look like. I know that the network is kind of messed it up a bit today, but I do hope that you have um, learned a few things this evening. Um, if you have a question, I'd like to see it. We have about four minutes. I'll take the first question and I'll just, um, that I see and then I'll round this off. I promise you we're going to bring Mr. Wesley back sometime soon and then we are going to have this conversation all over again, all over again. We have been told that we should do Zoom. So Wesley, please um, oblige us when we ask you to come back. Um, we'll do a Zoom conference. Uh, or, or a Zoom meeting so that we can have good conversation. But the thing is that Zoom is still dependent on internet in Abuja, isn't it? As long as it's in Abuja, we will not see the internet. But we'll see how that goes. So we need to learn protocols. We need to understand that our mind is powerful beyond what you can think. You need to remember that grace demands more than the law demands. Grace demands your entire life. You need to know that grace, em grace empowers you to be able to live within the parameters that God has set for you. You need to recognize that freedom in God is the capacity to live within parameters. Is there something else I'm missing? Thank you so much this evening. I'm just going to bring this to a close. Um, I hope this session has been a blessing to you. I apologize even though it's not um, any of our doing, we apologize regardless that we do not give you as seamless uh, an experience as we could have given you. What I'm asking you to do is um, that you prayerfully consider what we've brought from you to you this today. Don't take it, uh, swallow it hook, line, and sinker. Take it before your God and your Father and let Him um, elaborate on it for you and explain it to you in a language that you will understand. And like I said, we will come back another time and we will bring you part two of this. Thank you so much for being part of the um, of BMM Life today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you. Wesley, thank you so much for joining. I know that it will be better the next time that we try to do this. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May he continue to hold you in his hand, hands. I really, 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 really um, have a lot, a load of regards for you, Wesley, and your work with God. And I know that on a daily and consistent basis, I mean, I do get to talk to you. Not daily and consistent, not daily, but consistently I will talk to you. I am very clear that I will always hear how the Lord is clearing the ways for you, for you to continue to excel in all that he's called you to. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining the session today. I'll see you next Thursday. I'll have my sister Audrey with me next Thursday and we'll be talking collaborations. So I'll see you next week Thursday and we would plan between me and Mr. Wesley, we will plan our next meet and I will let you know. Do have a great rest of your evening and um, God bless you. Bye-bye.